just pulled up to TCH Dallas. It is a beautiful Saturday afternoon and I'm here to play the $365 tournament, 20K guarantee, 30 minute levels, great structure, but I'm running a little bit late. So I'm not gonna start with that many big blinds. So depending on how that goes afterwards, gonna play some cash and as always, hopefully get some good hands for the vlog. So anyway, I'll see you guys in there. Today I'm doing something I haven't done in a very long time. I am presenting to you a poker tournament vlog. We've been doing a lot of cash games, so I'm so excited to jump in and share every single hand I played or didn't play in this $365 tournament at Texas Card House. You guys gotta check out these amazing tournaments if you live in the Dallas area. The $365 one is a 20K guarantee. The turnouts are always great, and if that's not enough for you, they also have a $500 buy-in, $50,000 guarantee tournament the last Saturday of every month. So make sure you guys get out here and play these tournaments. They are awesome. All right, let's get into this tournament. Tournament. Starting stack is 30,000 and the blinds go up every 30 minutes. A great structure for this 20K guarantee tournament. All right, let's get into some hands. So I regged a little bit late, so I'm starting with 30,000 in chips, but the blinds are 400, 800, 800, which leaves us with 37 and a half big blinds. In this hand, we are under the gun one and look down at queen nine of diamonds. As you can see, this hand is a pure open. However, we'll start folding queen eight suited, but queen nine is just good enough to put in a raise, so I make it 2,000. The low jack calls and then the big blind puts in the three bet and he raises to 7,000. This raise size is very, very small. He should be going way bigger being in the big blind. He's giving us a very good price to continue. However, in tournaments, every single big blind is valuable. We don't wanna call here leaving room for the low jack to come in and then go multi-way in a spot where we might be absolutely dominated. As you can see, queen nine suited is a fold and we're actually gonna be folding a ton of our hands and only continuing with the top of our range. Tens, jacks, queens, kings, and aces, of course, and our suited ace king and ace queen type hands. Honestly, in this population, I'm probably folding ace jack suited as well. And as you can see, ace five suited and ace four suited are sometimes played as all-ins or four bets. However, in these smaller stakes tournaments, we will not be using these hands as bluffs because our opponents are very heavily weighted towards very strong hands and value, so we do not want to get crazy or spicy. However, if we are playing against opponents that are capable of three betting super light, then we would definitely consider putting these in as four bets or jams. So as played, I let it go. The other player does continue in the hand, so I got to see both hands, and the big blind had ace jack suited, which I was a little bit surprised to see that, because if we're in the big blind, as you can see, ace jack suited is a pure call because he has to be concerned about my range being very strong from being under the gun one. However, if he wanted to get spicy, he can use a hand like ace jack offsuit, a hand that doesn't really like to call, block some strong hands, isn't suited, and so therefore can play as a three bet bluff. But in the big blind, you generally just want to flat a ton of hands, as you can see. So anyway, I think in a vacuum, our play is good and we're going to move on to the next one. In this vlog, I'm going to be going over the hands I played and the hands that I didn't play in hopes that you guys learned something. I'm also going to be showing the GTO solver a lot, and the solver is not an end-all right or wrong. The key to being a profitable poker player is using the GTO solver as our foundation and then finding ways to exploit our opponents depending on their player types. So in this hand, the hijack opens, I have 25 big blinds as the blinds have gone up and around. I look down at ace-8 offsuit in the small blind. I see a lot of players make some grave errors from the small blind, and this is one of those types of hands where you just want to be folding most of the time. As you can see, we can use some of these hands as 3-bet bluffs, however in this population, I'm not going to choose speculative spots. However, as you can see, we will be continuing with all of our suited ace-x combinations, and throwing some of them in as 3-bets. We are going to be jamming most of our pocket pairs in this spot, and be flatting hands that if we make top pair, we can just stack off because SPR will be very shallow given our stack size. So with ace eight offsuit, facing a hijack open with 25 big blinds, we are gonna put in the fold. In this hand, I have 25,000 chips and blinds are 500, 1,000, 1,000 big blind ante. There's an under the gun raise and then it folds to me and I'm in the low jack. This was a very close spot and at the time I was thinking that I'm supposed to be folding a lot of my suited connecting type hands because we want hands that can make strong hands post flop and then stack off with our stack size. So 910 suited is very close. Sometimes it's a fold. Most of the time it's a call and a very, very small percentage of the time it's a three bet. Because of the fact I thought I was supposed to be folding a lot of these marginal suited connector type hands, I put in the fold at the time. However, I think it had been totally fine to just flat this one and try to play a pot post flop. In this hand, I have 24,000 chips, so 24 big blinds at 500, 1,000, 1,000. The low jack raises to 2,000, the high jack calls, and I'm in the big blind with 10, seven offsuit. This was a great spot to review what my calling range should be from the big blind, and as you can see, it's a bunch of hands. 
However, the majority of the time this hand is a fold, but can be played as a call. We go three ways to a flop of 8-8-6 with two hearts. It checks around. The turn is the ace of spades. With a different turn card, like a 9-7-5-4, I can consider starting to bluff in this spot as we have 10 high and a gutter, as this flop texture is going to favor me more than it is the original razor most of the time but with the ace on the turn, I cannot do anything. Luckily, it checks around again. The river is the seven, and now the low jack bets full pot. Even though we make a pair on the river, I have to put in the fold here, and we're gonna move on to the next one. In this hand, we get to deviate a little bit from what the solver says. Stacks are 22,500 and blinds are still 500, 1,000, 1,000, so I have 22.5 big blinds. I'm in the cutoff and look down at queen three of clubs. As you can see, this hand is just outside of a raise from this position, but as you can see from the button, it is a raise. So in spots like this, I like to look over and see who my opponent is on the button. We have to ask ourselves, is this a player that likes to defend their button a lot? And is this a player who likes to three bet their button? If the answer to both of these questions is no, then we can liberally raise a lot more hands from the cutoff, even including hands like queen three of clubs. If you're in the cutoff and the button is a very, very tight player who hardly ever calls on the button, you are in an absolute gold mine position. You essentially have the button every single time it's folded over to you. And well, this is gonna print you a ton of big blinds in tournament spots like this. But there's one other thing to consider before opening a hand like this. We have to think about the blinds. Does a small blind or a big blind like to three bet a lot? Are they very sticky defending their blinds? If the answer to this is no, then we can liberally open a ton of hands from the cutoff. And we'll be printing big blinds as most of the time we'll raise, the smaller big blind will defend and call, we'll see a flop, they'll check, we'll bet, and we'll take it down as they're not gonna make a hand most of the time. So these are super important dynamics to take into account, especially playing at tournaments. So when I raise to 2200, the button sure enough folds, and then the small blind who just doubled up with aces and is very, very tight, puts in the three bet to 7500. The big blind then calls the 7500, and now it's back on me. The beauty of raising hands like this is we don't need to defend this one. We can just let it go and live to see another day. The small blind woke up with pocket kings, and the big blind had queens. So it's very important not to get results oriented in this spot in a vacuum, raising this hand from this position given the player dynamics is printing money and we're gonna move on to the next hand. All right, this is another hand I folded, and this is such a common mistake I see among so many tournament players. We have 20,300 chips or 20-ish big blinds at 500, 1,000, 1,000. I'm under the gun too and look down at pocket threes. I know, I know guys, it's a pair. It's so tempting to limp it or raise it, but this is just a fold. I see so many players either raise or limp these hands, and the problem with this is if you limp, you're gonna get raised and then have to call a raise and then see a flop and fold when you miss your set, or if you raise and get three bet or shoved on, you just have to fold and now you just wasted two to three to four big blinds and that is a huge mistake in these tournaments. So start folding these smaller pocket pairs when you're under the gun or under the gun one with this specific stack size in these situations, it is just a fold. <laughs> In this hand, I have 18,300 chips or 18.3 big blinds as it's still 500, 1,000, 1,000. The low jack raises to 2.3 big blinds. It folds around to me in the big blind and I look down at queen four of hearts. We know our calling range is super wide from the big blind, so this hand is definitely going to be a call. We go heads up to a flop of king eight three with two hearts, so we flop ourselves the queen high flush draw. On this board texture, we are never leading into the preflop raiser, so we check. My opponent then bets 3,300 or 3.3 big blinds. At the time, I thought I was just supposed to make the call, but as you can see here, our exact hand wants to raise about 80% of the time and calling only about 16% of the time. So as played, I put in the call and we head to a turn, which is the king of hearts. So now we make our heart flush and now I'm hoping my opponent has a king. Again, on this card, we are hardly ever leading with any of our range in this spot. So I put in the check and then my opponent checks behind. The river is an offsuit Six, changing absolutely nothing. Now we can't let this one check through. We can mix between betting small a small percentage of the time, or we can go for about a 40% pop bet, and that's what I decided to do. So I bet 6,500. My opponent must have not had anything because he put in the fold, but we finally take down a pot here in this tournament, and now we're up to about 25 big blinds. So right after we finally win a pot and have over 25 big blinds, the blinds now go up. 
So now I have 21.5 big blinds. Welcome to tournament poker. But we look down at ace 10 suited under the gun. This one's definitely gonna be good enough to put in the raise. So I make it 2,500 and we take it down and pick up the blinds, which is always great in tournaments. I want to note another common spot I see players make a lot of mistakes in. Kind of a similar situation to earlier when I had the 9-10 of hearts, it's a speculative hand to play when you're sub 25 big blinds depending on what position you're in at the table. And this hand, under the gun, who is a very tight older gentleman, raises to two big blinds. I'm in the low jack and look down at 6-7 suited. I know guys, it's very tempting, you're in position, you have a suited connector, but let me explain why this is not a good hand to call with this stack depth. Our hand is going to flop a lot of draws, pair plus straight draws, hands like that that we need to see all three streets to realize our equity and we just don't have enough chips to be able to call bets on flops and turns without putting our stack in and when we put our stack in we're most likely crushed against a very strong range from early position so we have to let these types of hands go when we're at this stack depth we want to have hands that are a lot stronger to continue in this position so as you can see we pretty much only have jams from this spot and honestly i'm probably not going to be jamming hands like king jack suited or king 10 suited ace 10 suited against this player type raising under the Gun. He's going to be very nutted, so I'm probably only jamming 10s or better, and even 10s is a little bit on the cusp for me. I'm probably going to be jamming ace-king suited, jacks, queens, kings, and aces, and of course ace-king offsuit. So all that to say, we're definitely going to fold this suited connector and wait for a better spot with our 18 big blinds. All right, and now on to the most exciting hand in the tournament so far. Blinds are still 600, 1200, 1200, and I have about 17 big blinds to start the hand. We're a little bit short-handed in this one, so I'm in early position and look down at pocket sevens. I thought it was fine to open, which I later reviewed it was, so I make it two big blinds. Then the low jack, one of the more competent players at the table, goes all in for slightly more than what I have. It folds back around to me. As you can see, the GTO solver says pocket sevens is at the bottom, but it is indeed a call. But now we need to look at our opponent and see if we need to exploitatively fold this one. This opponent is one of the more competent players in the tournament, so I know he's capable of shoving hands like king-queen suited, ace-queen, ace-king suited, and all the ace-king offsuit varieties. So it's likely that we're up against two overcards. If we're in the unfortunate situation where he has a bigger pocket pair than us, well, then we still have some equity to try and hit a set. But to double up in this tournament and go from about 17 big blinds to 40 big blinds, these are the flips you have to take in these types of tournaments, and we're happy to get it in. So I put in the call, and he Here's what happened. So we were indeed off to the races against ace-king offsuit. We fade the ace or the king and we get the double and so now we have almost 40 big blinds and we're sitting good to try and make it deep in this tournament. So right before this hand, I had peeled from the small blind with ace, deuce of diamonds versus a cutoff open with the flop and folded. So now we are here. Blinds are still 600, 1200, 1200, and I have about 37 big blinds. There's a raise under the gun, and then under the gun two makes the call. I'm on the cutoff and look down at ace, queen of clubs. Part of the reason I was so excited to share this vlog with you is I've been doing a ton of solver study and a ton of studying in tournaments and trying to get better and know these spots better. Every single day I study, the more I realize there's so much I don't know. But today was the very first tournament I ever felt super prepared and felt like I made a lot of really good decisions, even in spots that were very marginal. And this spot was no different as there was an under the gun raise, under the gun one calls, and now I'm in the cutoff with ace queen of clubs. What do I do? Do I three bet? Do I just go all in? Do I fold? Well, in this spot, as you can see, ace queen suited is just a pure call. It's a really beautiful hand to flat and play my hand a little bit deceptively. And if we hit an ace or a queen, then we flop a monster and we're able to just go with our hand. So as played, I make the call. And then something very unexpected happens. The button, who is a very, very, very tight player, who's been folding, 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 only showing monsters, he shoves for 45,000 chips. The under the gun original razor goes deep into the tank, he thinks forever and ever, and finally, reluctantly, puts in the fold. The player to his left then puts in the fold, and now it's back on me. What in the world do we do? At the time, I knew in a vacuum, ace-queen suited could be a call or a fold here, but we have to look at the player type. 
is this opponent to my left on the button, this tight player, is he ever shoving with worse? The only hand I can hope that he has is a hand like possibly tens or jacks, but even with this player type, I think he's just flatting tens and possibly even jacks preflop facing an under the gun open and two callers in front of him. And if he somehow has a hand like ace king, we are absolutely crushed. If this player was a GTO bot, someone who plays very aggressively, then we could totally consider putting in the call with ace queen suited. But against this player, we are just going to fold. So I slide my cards into the muck and then this player flips over pocket aces. Case closed. After a few lost pots, we find ourselves with 28,300 chips and the blinds are 600, 1200, 1200. There's a limp from the hijack who had just sat down at our table, but since he'd been here, he's been limping almost every single hand pre-flop, so I know he's going to be limping a very wide range. It folds around to me on the button, and I look down at King-10 offsuit. We block strong hands, we have position, we know that the blinds are very fit or fold, so they're probably going to be folding out if I raise, so we'll be able to get this pot heads up in position, and that's a great result. So I raise to 3,300. As predicted, the limper makes the call, so now we're going to go three ways to a flop of King-3 eight rainbow. He checks it over to me and not only is this a great board for our range, but this is a great board for our exact hand as we have clear value flopping top pair. And this is a board that we're going to be down betting our entire range on, so I bet a small amount of 2,000. We want to keep all worse hands in as it's very likely we have the best hand. So when I bet 2,000, he makes the call and we head to a turn card, which is an offsuit three. Now my opponent checks yet again. Now we have to decide if we want to start narrowing ranges or if we want to check this one through and try to get more value on the river. I think in this exact spot in this tournament, it's totally okay to continue going for value. Although we're going to start folding out a lot of his 8x combinations or smaller pocket pairs and hands that we have beat. But I also think there's merit to denying equity. So I decide to bet 4,000, which is only three and a half big blinds. He then check raises to 10,000. This is a very unfortunate spot. It doesn't make a ton of sense. He's repping a slow played set if he happened to have pocket eights, although I think he would raise that hand a fair frequency of the time pre-flop. He shouldn't have any strong king x combinations unless he had exactly king jack suited, but I don't think that hand wants to check raise. I think that hand wants to continue calling. I think he raises king queen pre-flop as well as ace king, so this seems weird. The only conclusion I could come to because he's really narrowing ranges is that he probably turned turned another three. Players don't check raise as bluffs, especially on these dry textures. There's really nothing going on on this board. It's a really sucky spot for me because now if I fold, I'm left with 15 big blinds. But at these lower stakes tournaments, when players show strength, especially check raising, alarm bells should be going off. So I do indeed put in the fold and my opponent flashes ace three suited. So again, we can't be results oriented. We got what we wanted on the flop. Our opponent called us with a three. We got more value. It just so happens that he got lucky and being another three on the turn. It's also worth noting that if my opponent would have missed the flop and we have king high, we would have bet and taken it down so we would have been printing more big blinds. We saved 15 big blinds, we're still in the tournament, and we live to see another hand. In this hand, I get to talk about one of my favorite things to do as a short stack. Blinds are now 1,000, 1,500, 1,500, and sadly, the blinds have gone up and around, and so now we find ourselves with 19,000 chips. I'm in the low jack and look down at pocket aces. A very common mistake I see from a lot of recreational or beginner to intermediate players is they'll just shove all in with this hand. Shoving all in with pocket aces when we have 13 big blinds when it's folded around to us in the low jack is a mistake because we force our opponents to make correct decisions and in poker we never want to make our opponents decisions easy. For example, if I min raise and someone isn't paying attention to my stack size, they might 3 bet with a worse hand. They could 3 bet with a hand like ace king, ace queen, ace jack, etc. We can also induce smaller pocket pairs to shove over our open behind us. Another reason we're incentivized to min raise is because of SPR. SPR stands for stack to pot ratio. For example, if we min raise and the big blind calls, now our stack to pot ratio is very, very small and we're basically going to be going all in no matter what the board texture comes and we're completely fine with that. If we min raise and the big blind calls, we want them in there with a very wide range of hands. We want them to put money in the pot and we want them to commit because essentially when we have 
pocket aces, we have their entire range absolutely crushed. So in this hand, I raised to 3,000, which is two big blinds. Only the big blind calls, which is a great result, and the flop comes ace, king, queen with two spades, so we are ecstatic to flop top set, even though this board is a little bit scary. However, because of our stack size, we're never folding, no matter what happens. He checks, and now I'm gonna bet very small, and I make it 2,000. He calls, which is another great result. So now we head to a turn card, which is the three of diamonds. We're gonna continue betting. Now I think we can bet a tiny bit bigger, given that there's two flush draws out there and a couple straight draws. Again, we're very short stacked. We don't wanna force our opponent to play correctly if we don't have to, so I bet 5,000. He makes the call yet again. The river is the four of spades and my opponent checks. I don't mind that the four is a spade because again, we have the ace of spades in our hand, so we block a lot of flushes. Now, the way that we've played this hand, we've set ourselves up for a perfect river jam and it's giving our opponent an insane price to call with a lot of hands. Unfortunately, my opponent didn't have much at all as he had jack three suited, so we squeaked out a little extra value on the flop and on the turn, and of course, my opponent had to fold the river, but it's a beautiful example because if we would have shoved pre flop, the jack three would have folded and we wouldn't have picked up those precious big blinds. So the blinds went around and I played one two big blind pot before this hand and so now our stack is back down to 22,000 and the blinds are 1,000, 1,500, 1,500 so we have about 13 big blinds. It folds all the way around to me on the button and I have ace king offsuit. This is a different situation than having pocket aces because yes we have a very strong hand but it's not a made one and in this case if we shove and everyone folds because how precious all these big blinds are we're happy to take it down. As you can see you can min raise a very small percentage of the time but in this case I I'd rather just take the big blinds and build up my stack without having to see a showdown. So going into the second break of the day, I have 27,000 chips and I'm gonna be coming back to 13 and a half big blinds. The first hand I see back from break is ace nine off two under the gun with 13.5 big blinds. I think another mistake players make is they see an ace under the gun with 13 and a half big blinds. They know they're gonna be in the blinds next hand and so they panic and shove. However, this hand is not a shove at this stack depth and even though the blinds are coming around and you have to pay the big blind and the big blind Annie, don't worry, you still are going to have 11 big blinds and a whole nother orbit to find a good hand. I think we can wait for a better spot. So the very next hand, it folds all the way around to the button. The button is an extremely competent player. I know he's solid and not only is he a good player, he is absolutely destroying this table, running like God. He raises the button and he's been raising a ton of hands. So I know he's gonna be really wide in this spot. The small blind folds and then it's on me. I have about 13 big blinds behind and I look down at ace jack off suit. As you can see, this is a slam dunk all in spot, especially against a wide button opening range. So I I go all in and then the button doesn't even think and he puts in his chips, flips over his hand and here's what happened. Give me a heart. So unfortunately for us, we get a button versus big blind, super cooler. The button wakes up with ace king off suit and unfortunately sends us to the rail. I had an absolute blast playing this tournament and I hope you guys enjoyed it and learned something. I know I took a lot away from this tournament and I can't wait to do more tournament vlogs. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see more vlogs like this one. It's so exciting to finally play a tournament and vlog it. So I hope you guys enjoyed. There was a lot of little pieces in there that I hope you guys learned from. Final hand, so unfortunate that the button who was just on fire, chip leading, wakes up with a monster when really ace jack offsuit right there, button versus big blind is a monster. <laughs> so unfortunate, but you're in for 365 out for the big old goose egg, but I've really noticed a lot of improvement in my tournament game. Now certain spots that I'm guessing, not sure if I'm supposed to call, raise, or fold. Now it's just becoming more natural to me after doing a lot of work with solvers. I hope you guys learned something in terms of the GTO versus exploitive plays. Like sometimes if GTO says not to do something, but you know something exploitative that you can take advantage of, then that's when we can kind of deviate a little bit. But at least we know our baseline and our fundamentals, so that's what's important. Anyway, if you guys enjoyed the vlog, would you do me a huge favor and go all in and like, comment, and subscribe? It would mean the world to me. We are just getting started. It is only up from here. I'll see you guys next time.